Hello there, I'm Thundaga, and welcome to my How to Make a Pokemon Game tutorial series. This series will cover all of the essential info you need to make a Pokemon game in RPG Maker and Pokemon Essentials. In this episode, we'll be looking at trainers. We'll be looking at all of the different elements that go into setting up a trainer battle event, and we'll make our own custom new trainer along the way. First, we'll discuss trainer types and how they are defined. We'll also make our new trainer type for our game. Next, we'll discuss the trainer's text PBS file and how a trainer's Pokemon team is set up. After that, we'll create our trainer event so they can see us and walk up to us and initiate a battle. And finally, we'll test it all out in-game and fight our trainer. And, as a couple of bonus items, we'll also touch briefly on trainer battle intro animations and losable battles. With all of that said, let's get into it! When first defining a trainer, there are two PBS files that we need to edit. As a reminder, PBS files are text files that live inside of our game's PBS folder. These text files control a lot of the data in our game. Within our PBS folder here, there are two text files that we want to edit, and those are trainer underscore types and trainers. Let's open up trainer underscore types, and let's also open up trainers. I use Notepad++ for all of my text file editing, and a download link for this will be in the description. Notepad++ isn't mandatory though, and you can use whatever text editor you want, or whichever you're most comfortable with. Even the standard Notepad program can get the job done! I made my Notepad++ dark blue by going into Settings, Style Configurator, and selecting Ruby Blue. Now, let's look into trainer types. Here we can see that there are many different trainer types that are already set up. Let's scroll to the bottom and start making our own new trainer type. I'm going to copy this line here and paste one underneath because it's a nice little divider. Now the first thing that we need when creating a new trainer type is to give it an ID. The trainer type's ID is a unique string of text that's encased in brackets here. I was thinking it would be fun to make an alternate version of a youngster called a pro youngster, so let's just type in pro youngster. I just gotta spell it right, there we go! This ID is important and will be referenced by a lot of other things in our game. For example, this ID determines what the names of our trainer's sprites should be. Since we've called ours Pro Youngster, we need to name our sprites Pro Youngster as well. Every trainer should have at least two sprites, their Overworld Sprite and their Battle Sprite. Now, technically, the Overworld Sprites are optional. We could have our Pro Youngster's event graphic use the same Overworld Sprite as the base Youngster, so in this case, Trainer underscore Youngster. I do think that it looks better for the game, though, if we make unique looking sprites for each trainer's Overworld Sprite. As a little example, even though the Bird Keeper and Rocker trainer types are different, they both have the same looking overworld sprite, but they are two unique image files. These are trainer underscore Bird Keeper and trainer underscore Rocker. If we ever plan to use this trainer type as a character that we can register and call in the phone, or use event commands to generate this trainer, then we will need their corresponding overworld sprite for this trainer ID. So in that case, we would still need our trainer underscore pro youngster overworld sprite, and it would no longer be optional. The phone registry and trainer generation stuff are way more complicated topics, and we can dive into those in a later tutorial. Anyway, since I already made our pro youngster overworld sprite and battler sprite here, we might as well use them. Let's make sure we plug them into the proper locations in our game's graphics folders. Let's start with the overworld sprite. I'm gonna grab it and copy it. The overworld sprites need to go in our game's graphics characters folder. If we scroll to the bottom here, we can see that there's a lot of other trainer overworld sprites here. It's a good idea for our sprite to also follow the same naming convention, which is trainer underscore trainer ID. So for example, trainer underscore youngster. The sprite that we're pasting in is trainer underscore pro youngster. So I'm just going to paste it in and there it is. Now let's look into the battle sprite. I'm going to copy it. The battle sprite for our trainer needs to go in the graphics trainers folder. In here, these are all the sprites that will show up in battle when we fight against this trainer type. The name of the sprite is just based on the ID of that trainer, so for example, this is just Youngster. Let's paste ours in, and here we can see our Pro Youngster. And that'll do it for our trainer sprites, let's go back and look at our trainer type. The next thing we need to set up is the trainer type's name. We can do this just by typing in name equals, and then the name we want. This is what we'll display in-game when we fight this trainer. So let's type Pro, and then a space, and then Youngster. This doesn't need to perfectly match our trainer's ID, and we can put whatever we want in the name field. A good example for this would be Pokemon Ranger underscore M. Their name is just Pokemon Ranger. There are Pokemon Ranger underscore M and Pokemon Ranger underscore F as separate trainers with their own different sprites and trainer types, but when we fight either of them in game, their name will just display as Pokemon Ranger. In this sense, it's possible for multiple trainer types that have different IDs to have the same name. 
Another good example of this would be that all the gym leaders have different IDs, but they share the same name of gym leader. Brock is a gym leader, Misty is a gym leader, and so on and so forth. After this is the trainer's gender. We can type in female, male, or unknown. For our pro youngster, let's type male. Unknown can be useful for trainer duos, such as Crushkin or Cool Couple. If this is ever unset for a trainer type, it will default to unknown. The next field is base money. This determines how much money we get from beating this type of trainer. The money we actually earn from the battle is this value multiplied by the highest level Pokemon in the trainer's team. So, for example, if our base money is 100, and we fight a trainer whose highest level Pokemon is 50, then we'll earn $5,000 when we win the battle. That's a lot of money. If this value is ever unset, it will default to a value of 30. Next up are a couple of optional, but still very important fields, starting with skill level. Skill level determines how smart this trainer's AI is. This can be a value from 0 to 100. 100 being the highest value that actually makes a difference. Set this to a high value if you want this trainer type to be a more skilled battler. After this is Intro BGM. This may be an optional field, but I would argue that this really needs to be set for every trainer type, since it adds so much to the game. Intro BGM is the music that plays when this trainer spots us before a battle. Here are some example clips with and without Intro BGM set up, and just listen to how much of a difference it makes. In my opinion, this is super important and every trainer should have it. For our example project, I've downloaded a song called HGSS 117 Trainer's Eyes Meet Youngster and added it to our game's audio BGM folder. I downloaded this song from Endless's pre-looped music library. This is an amazing resource where entire Pokemon soundtracks have been looped and exported into the OGG format for you to use in your fan games. It was made by Endless, with some additional contributions from YT Crackerwatt and some guy named Thundaga? I can't really pronounce this one. Anyway, this is a fantastic resource, and I highly recommend you make use of it for your fan games. So, let's take the name of that audio file and just paste it in right here. And there we go, we've got Intro BGM for our pro youngster. Now, let's look at the next two fields, because these are related to music as well. These are Battle BGM and Victory BGM. These are the music that play during the battle and after the battle when we win. For our game, I've downloaded some more songs from Endless's pre-looped music library. The songs I downloaded are from Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. These are Oras 017 Battle Trainer Battle and Oras 018 Victory Trainer Battle. Let's just go take these real quick and plug them in for the battle BGM and then grab this one and plug it in as the Victory BGM. If Battle BGM and Victory BGM are ever unset for a trainer type, the default Battle and Victory BGMs will be used instead. The defaults are defined in metadata.txt in our game's PBS folder. Here we can see the defaults for Wild and Trainer Battle BGM, as well as their Victory BGMs. We can see a lot of other things in here as well, but let's go over all of these in another tutorial related to game metadata. That about does it for our new trainer type. Now, let's set up the trainer inside of trainers.txt. In here, we can see that there are a bunch of trainers already defined. Every trainer has an ID and their personal name in brackets at the start of their definition. So here at the top, we can see Camper Liam. Then underneath, they have a lose text. This is what the trainer will say after you beat them in a battle. So if we beat Camper Liam, he'll say, a very good battle indeed. Trainers can also have a list of items that they'll use in battle. For example, Brock here has a full restore, and then another full restore. What a cheater. Underneath these are the trainer's Pokemon. Pokemon are added to the trainer's party by typing Pokemon equals, and then the species name in all caps, and then the Pokemon's level. So for example, this is a Geodude at level 12. Pokemon IDs, as well as item IDs and move IDs, must all be capitalized and spelled properly. The IDs for all of these can be found inside of their respective PBS files. So items.txt for all of the item IDs, Pokemon.txt for all the Pokemon IDs, and moves.txt for all the move IDs. And we've already looked into trainertypes.txt for trainer IDs. Make sure there are no typos when using any of these IDs. If you misspell anything, such as a single Pokemon ID, the game will not compile and throw error messages. 
As we can see with the Geodude and Onyx here, there are also a lot of additional options that we can set for each Pokemon. We can set their nickname, their gender, if they're shiny, give them custom move pools, we can set their ability index, give them a held item, set their EVs and or IVs, change their Pokeball, and so much more. I'll link the full list in the video description. And yes, we can even set to Shadow if we set Shadow equals yes for Shadow Pokemon. The Team Rocket Grunts here have a Shadow Weepin' Bell and a Shadow Electabuzz, for example. Another very important thing to note is that trainers can also have a party ID. This is optional and defaults to zero, but this is a super cool feature that allows us to give the same trainer different Pokemon parties. To set the party ID, add a comma, and then the ID number in the brackets next to that trainer's name. A good example of party ID usage is our rival. Down here, we can see that rival one blue has a default party with a Pidgeotto, a Rattata, and a Bulbasaur. Underneath this, though, is Rival 1 Blue with Party ID 1, where that Bulbasaur has been replaced by a Charmander. Underneath that is a Rival 1 Blue with a Party ID 2, where that Charmander is now a Squirtle. In our Trainer Battle event, we can set the Party ID, so we can choose which version of the Trainer we want to fight in our event. This is super useful for Rivals, or if you want to have another Trainer that you fight early in the game that has a weak team, and then they appear later in the game with a strong team. In this example, you could fight Party ID 0 at the start of the game, and then later in the game, you could fight Party ID 1. You can define as many Party IDs as you want. I like to use Party IDs a lot for enemy team Grunts, by the way. Instead of giving each Team Rocket Grunt a name, you could just fight Grunt 1, and then Grunt 2, and then Grunt 3, and so on. Now, let's scroll to the very bottom of the list and begin making our own new trainer party here for our pro youngster. Again, let's just copy this dividing line and then go down here and paste it. I want to make sure that I get the formatting just right so it looks very nice. Now, let's make brackets and then enter our trainer ID, which would be pro youngster. Gotta make sure I spell it right. Then, let's give our pro youngster a name. Let's do something like Cameron. I think that's just a pretty cool name. Then, since this is a pro youngster, let's do items equals and give them a super potion. Then underneath this, let's set the lose text equal to, ah, you beat me, GG. For his Pokemon team, let's do Pokemon equals. I was thinking it'd be cool to give him a Larvitar. We need to make sure that this is in all caps, by the way. Let's do a Larvitar at level 20. And then, for fun, let's make that Larvitar shiny. We can do this by saying shiny equals yes. This will be a cool trainer to fight since he's got a shiny. And maybe in our game, all the pro youngsters could be shiny hunters. In that case, let's give him another Pokemon. Let's say Pokemon equals and give them a Rattata at level 20. And let's say shiny equals yes for Rattata as well. There we go. Now he's got two shiny Pokemon on his team. Now, for fun, let's make another version of Pro Youngster Cameron. Let's give him a more advanced team. So what we can do is copy and paste this, and then let's say Party ID 1. As a refresher, this is Party ID 0 here, and now underneath here will be Party ID 1. Let's make him a bit stronger too. Let's give him a full restore, so he's a cheater like Brock. And then when you beat him, you could say, Aw, you beat me again! GG! Now, let's upgrade his Pokemon team. Instead of a Larvitar, let's fully evolve it so it's a Tyranitar. And let's move it up to like level 70. This guy's got a big power boost. And we can give him a Raticate that's level 70 as well. There we go. Now let's make sure we save this, and I think we're basically all done setting up our trainers. Making trainer parties is kind of fun. We can actually test this battle in-game now through the use of the debug menu. Since we made some changes to our game's PBS text files, we need to make sure our game compiles those changes on our next boot, so let's hold down left control and press playtest and hold left control to ensure that everything is compiled. All right, now that we're in game, let's press F9 to open the debug menu and then let's go down to battle options. Then from here, we can go down to test trainer battle and we can see all of the trainers that we've defined in our game. We can see their trainer ID, their name, their party ID, and we can even see how many Pokemon that they have in their party. In the bottom right, we can see each and every Pokemon in the selected trainer's party, as well as that Pokemon's level. This list is organized alphabetically, so let's scroll down a little bit until we find our pro youngster. Hey, and there he is! We can see both parties we set up for our youngster here as well. Check it out, there's a level 70 Tyranitar there. I don't want to fight that guy. Let's go up and select our other pro youngster and then press enter to begin the trainer battle. And listen to that, he's even got the Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire battle theme. That's pretty good. 
Oh my gosh, he has a shiny Larvitar! Wow, what a cool looking Pokemon! At any time, if we want to debug complete the battle, we can hold down left control and go and select run. From here, we could choose to debug win, or if we select no, we could choose to debug lose the battle. For the purpose of our testing though, let's debug win. And look at that, we just beat Cameron, the pro youngster. Aw, you beat me, GG. And we got that money too. And listen, it's playing the Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire victory theme. I think that sounds pretty nice, right on. So there's our pro youngster already. But now we should make an event for our pro youngster so they can walk up to us and then battle us in our game. And thankfully, we don't need to make a new trainer event from scratch. We can go into Route 3 in the base essentials maps and see here along the left side of the map that there are a bunch of different trainer events that have already been set up. Let's take a look at this basic youngster here and go inside his event and see how it works. The first two event commands here are script commands that determine how the trainer sees us and walks up to us. The first one is PB Trainer Intro, which plays the intro BGM of the trainer ID specified when this trainer sees us. So we should right click and edit this and make sure that instead it says Pro Youngster. As an important note, when referencing the trainer ID in these script commands and methods, we need to add a colon in front. So inside of PB Trainer Intro, we need to type colon Pro Youngster. The next script command here is PB Notice Player Get Self. This makes it so our trainer can see us and notice us and then walk up to us. We don't need to edit this, so let's just leave this line as is. Another important thing when it comes to our trainer noticing us is the event's name. The name of our trainer must be Trainer with a number in parentheses afterwards. This number determines our trainer's vision range. So right now it's two, so our trainer can see two tiles. If we ever wanted to update this, we could say Trainer 3. Now they can see three tiles. This is based on the direction the trainer is facing too. So since our trainer is currently facing down, the trainer will spot us if we walk underneath them. We also wanna make sure that the trainer event trigger is set to event touch. This is necessary for our trainer to be able to spot us from afar. I'm realizing that right now we're editing the base youngster. So instead of editing this youngster, let's actually reset them to their default values, which was just youngster and two, and then Let's select it and copy it, then go back to our game's root one and paste it. Now, let's edit this youngster event and make it so that way instead of youngster, it's pro youngster. And let's give them a greater vision range of three. There we go. Now, let's look at the next event command in the list, which is just this show text here. This is just the line of text that our trainer displays before the battle. Right now, it's the classic line of, I like shorts, they're comfy and easy to wear. But let's update this since now we're gonna be fighting a pro youngster. Let's instead say, I'm a pro youngster. I wear pro shorts. There we go, look like I had a little typo there. There he is. Now let's hit okay and look at the next event command in the list. The next event command is a conditional branch and inside is a script calling the trainer battle method. The reason for this is that if we win the trainer battle, the conditional branch will be true and then we'll run all of the commands inside, which right now is just setting self switch A to on. We can add something else to happen after the battle too. We could say insert show text and have him say, you beat me, you're strong. Let me just fix my typos real quick and there we go. So now everything inside of this conditional branch will trigger if we win the battle. Inside of the conditional branch, we can see the trainer battle dot start script method being called. What this method does is take a trainer ID, so right now it's youngster, and the name of the trainer we wanna fight, and optionally a party ID number. So for example, after Ben here, we could do comma one. That way we would be fighting Ben with party ID one. For our game though, let's change it so instead it's the pro youngster that we just made. So instead of youngster, let's make it so the trainer ID is pro youngster. Then for the name, we got to keep it in quotes. Let's type Cameron, there we go. And let's actually fight Cameron at party ID one, which means Cameron is gonna have a level 70 Tyranitar. That's kind of scary. Now that we've got our conditional branch set up, let's look at the very last event command in the event. What this does is make it so that after the battle, our trainer event is no longer active or moving towards us. We don't need to ever edit this, so let's just leave this as is at the end of the event. Then if we win the battle, we'll be turning self switch A on, which then goes to the second event page, where if self switch A is on, what happens is we can just talk to the trainer and they'll say the line of dialogue, you can't get a trainer event simpler than me. This is pretty straightforward, so let's just leave this as is for now. 
There is one more thing we need to do. We need to make sure that our event graphic matches the trainer graphic that we made earlier. Let's double click this and let's find our pro youngster in the list. There he is. Let's make sure that this is set for both event pages. There we go. And bada boom, there's our pro youngster. Looking back through the list of event commands, we can see that our PB trainer intro is pro youngster. We can see the trainer battle dot start is for pro youngster Cameron. And if we go in and edit and go over to the end here, we can see that I'm fighting party ID one. At any time, if we wanted to just fight the default party ID zero, we could always delete this. But let's fight the stronger version of the trainer. Let's do one and let's hit okay. Now let's get in game and test this out. In order for our trainer battle to trigger, we need to make sure we have Pokemon in our party. Otherwise, it'll never trigger the trainer battle. To add Pokemon to our party, open the debug menu with F9 and then go down to Pokemon options. At any time, you could select add Pokemon to give yourself any Pokemon you want from this specific long list here. But I like to just use give demo party. This gives us six Pokemon that we can use as our demo party. And here they are. Now, let's walk up to our trainer who has a vision range of three and let's see this trainer battle trigger. Whoa, look at that, he saw us. I'm a pro youngster, I wear pro shorts. Whoa, holy moly, look at this. We're getting into the battle with our pro youngster and oh my goodness, it's party ID one. So there's that level 70 Tyranitar, that's very scary. Oh, and look at Sandstream. I think what I wanna do is debug win this battle. Aw, oh, you beat me again, GG. Ooh, we got a lot of money for winning. You beat me, you're strong. And look at that, it triggered the text that we set inside of the conditional branch. Now we've beaten our trainer and self switch A is on. So we can talk to them again. You can't get a trainer event simpler than me. Our trainer is now using event page two because we just beat them. That's awesome, there's our trainer, look at that. It's working so well in game, I love it. Now as a super pro tip for our trainers battle party ID, we can use a method called PB get and then a number. Right now I'm just putting X for placeholder. What pbget does is return the value of a variable, which is super handy. So for example, if we change this to seven, we would be getting the value of variable seven. I'll walk us through an example now, but it references our starter choice. So apologies if this is a little confusing, we'll be covering how to set up our starter choice events in a future tutorial. For this example, if we want to fight our rival blue and we want him to use parties zero, one, or two, depending on our starter picked, we could do the following. First, it's worth pointing out that there already exists a variable called starter choice. This is variable number seven. We could set this variable's value when we pick our starter. If we pick Squirtle, set the starter choice variable to zero. So we'll fight blue party ID zero with his Bulbasaur. If we pick Bulbasaur, set starter choice to one. So we'll fight blue party ID one with his Charmander. And lastly, if we pick Charmander, set starter choice to two. So we'll fight blue with his party ID two and his Squirtle. So that way, when we actually set up our blue trainer battle for the party ID, we could just say PB get seven, where we're getting the value of variable seven, which is our starter choice. Then later, if we wanted to make even more versions of blue, we could just say three plus PB get seven. This way we would be able to fight blue's party ID three, four, and five. This is pretty awesome. And apologies again if this is a little on the complex, confusing side. I hope that this all made sense though. And speaking of complex, one more thing that I wanna quickly mention is that double and triple battles are a bit more complex and I would wanna give them their own tutorial video in the future. In general though, I would recommend looking into and messing around with the trainer events that came with the base essentials route three map. One thing we can see here is that if two trainers are facing each other and you walk in between them, you can trigger a double battle. If you only have one Pokemon in your party though, it won't trigger a double battle and instead you'll fight each trainer one at a time. Now let's look at some fun stuff that we can use to juice up our trainer battle intros. One thing that some more climactic battles do is use battle intro animations. Let's look at a couple examples real quick by using the debug menu to force some trainer battles. We can view battle intro animations this way. It's great for testing. So these are all super cool, but let's make one now for our pro youngster. 
Thankfully, they're super easy to make too. We just need to add some image files to our game's graphics transitions folder. When we look inside of the transitions folder, we can see that a lot of battle intro images already exist for our trainers. Right here we can see we have the HGSS underscore versus images for a lot of the gym leaders. And we can see that HGSS versus has the image for the trainer ID, so HGSS underscore versus an example leader underscore surge. And then underneath we can see there's also HGSS versus bar images. These will be the background images that appear for that trainer ID when we do the battle intro. Underneath we can see there's also a couple Team Rocket related images. And underneath that we also have versus E4 for the champion here, and then the versus E4 bar, which would be the background for that animation. And lastly we have the more standard versus trainer images. Versus trainer has the face of the trainer, and then there's also the versus bar. So for example, versus bar underscore rival one. An important thing to note here is that we also have images for our player character. Currently, we're playing as Pokemon Trainer underscore Red, so when we trigger some of these animations, such as Verse Trainer or Verse E4, we'll see our character's face as well. I'll cover how to make new player characters in the future, but for now, just know that the default player characters are Red and Leaf. Another thing to keep an eye out for is if you have duplicates. When you do, the first defined item will be what's used. For example, we have an HGSS underscore versus rival one here at the top, and then at the bottom we have a versus trainer rival one. If we fight against a rival one right now, we'll see the HGSS version of the animation. For our pro youngster, I want to make an HGSS versus style animation similar to what our gym leaders here are using. And I went ahead and already made them. As we can see here, we have HGSS underscore versus pro youngster and HGSS underscore versus bar pro youngster. We need to make sure that the naming format is the exact same, so it's HGSS underscore versus and then our trainer ID. The same goes for HGSS underscore versus bar and then our trainer ID. I think these are all looking good though, what we can do is copy them and then go into our folder and paste them. Now that we have the two image files necessary for our battle intro animation added to our graphics transitions folder, let's test this out in game. So now when we cross paths with our pro youngster, we should see the battle intro animation. There we go, he says, I'm a pro youngster, I wear pro shorts. Whoa, look at that, that's a fancy animation. And we can see their name there too. Oh dang, pro youngster Cameron, this is gonna be an intense battle. So look at that, we got our battle looking pretty fancy. Now, let's move on to the last trainer related thing that I wanna cover in this video, and that's losable battles. The way that this can be accomplished is by using what's called battle rules. A great example of this is the Beauty Bridget trainer here on the Base Essentials Route 3 map. Before a battle is started, we can use this script command called set battle rule to set various rules for our next battle. I'll link a full list of all the battle rules in the video description. We can set a lot of different things here, such as can lose or cannot lose. We can also set can run or cannot run. We can also set no EXP to earn no experience from the battle. We can set no money to earn no money. And we can set disable pokeballs to prevent pokeballs from being used in the battle. And there are so many more battle rules we can use as well. One thing that's already being set here is backdrop. This changes the background and the battle bases underneath our Pokemon for the battle. Right now we can see that the backdrop is being set to Champion 1. We can find all of our battle backgrounds in the game's graphics battle backs folder. Here's the Champion 1 BG, and we can see that there's even more backgrounds in this folder. So, if we want to make our pro youngster battle losable, let's go and copy this set battle rule script event command, and then let's go back to our pro youngster event. Then let's paste this in so the set battle rule is before the battle starts. Now let's get in there and edit this, so instead we're doing set battle rule, and then what we can do is just type in can lose. This should make it so now we can lose this battle. And just to clarify, what I mean by can lose is that we can continue playing after the loss without blacking out and teleporting back to a Pokemon Center. By the way, now that we're working with script commands, I've got two pro tips to mention here. Tip number one, the script text window here can be a little bit small. Thankfully, there's a way to make it bigger. In our game's root folder is extendText.exe. If we have our script text window open, and then we go to our game folder and run extendText.exe, it will then make the window bigger. This will make our script command edit window larger, as well as our show text edit window. I use this all the time. 
And for tip number two, if we ever wanted to set multiple battle rules at the same time, we don't need to go and copy and paste and make a bunch of separate script event commands. We can instead just make the next script method on the next line. This way we can call multiple script methods within the same script event command. All right, now that we have can lose enabled for our battle, there is one more thing that we need to do. Remember from earlier when we were mentioning that the trainer battle takes place inside of a conditional branch where this happens when we win? Well, let's go in and edit our conditional branch and then check the box for set handling when conditions do not apply. Now, everything inside of this second section here will be what happens after we lose the battle. When we lose the battle, we won't black out or warp back to our home or Pokemon Center anymore and our Pokemon will be fully healed. What we can do now is also make it so that way the event says, Ha ha, I beat you. So we'll only see this message if we lose the battle. Then what we could do is we could also do a set move route for our player and have them take one step backward. So that way if we lose the battle, we won't be able to walk forward. This will kick us back to in front of the trainer again. And since we lost, let's make sure that we're not setting control switch A to on. We'll only set control switch A on if we win. Now, let's go lose a battle to our pro youngster. All right, let's walk up to our youngster and then he'll say, I'm a pro youngster. Yes, yes, yes. We know that he wears pro shorts. And those, shor those shorts are so pro that they're gonna be the key to his victory. We're gonna lose this battle now. So there's the level 70 Tyranitar. I'm very, very scared, but let's cut to the chase. Let's just lose this battle. Let's hold down left control on the keyboard and select run. And then instead of selecting yes here, let's select no. Treat this battle as a loss. Let's lose. There we go. We have no more Pokemon. Oh, we lost. Oh, we gave them money. Whoa, haha, -ha, I beat you. And there we go. It made us step one step backward, which unfortunately did re-trigger the battle. If we wanted to fix this, we'd have to make it so our player turns right and then takes one step backward. Let's show that off real quick. There we go, Cameron just beat us again and he says, haha, I beat you. Now the player should turn right and then take one step backward. Look at that. So now we can't walk past this trainer, but we can lose to them. I think that's pretty dang cool. As one final tip for our trainer battles, we can trigger them in the middle of a cutscene or another event by just using the conditional branch part of the trainer event. We don't need the PB trainer intro or PB trainer end if we're just using this in the middle of an event like a cutscene, but we can still do set battle rule. As an example, let's copy this pro youngster conditional branch and then go to our old man here. And right now he's still saying return to title screen from the last tutorial. But let's just throw in a, a bunch of texts real quick. Let's have him say A and then B. And then what we can do is trigger a battle. What this will do is trigger a battle against our pro youngster Cameron. We need to make sure that we're also copying over the set battle rules. So let's make it so this is a battle we can lose again. And look at this. This is how we would put a battle in the middle of a cutscene. So theoretically, you could have a bunch of stuff here. You could have them talking and then walking around and showing animations and such. And then you could trigger a battle from the middle of the event. One thing that's important to consider though, is if you ever decide to do a trainer battle this way, make sure you're only setting self switches and other things if you win. We don't want to mark this battle as done if we didn't win. And that about does it for trainers. Thank you so much for watching. If you learned something from this tutorial, please remember to like and subscribe. To access my tutorial website, please check the link in the video description. As a reminder, this tutorial is for Pokemon Essentials V20, so if a newer version is released in the future, such as V21, it is possible that the layout or functionality of some of the things I mentioned could be changed. In general though, this series should get you to where you need to go when it comes to making your own Pokemon fan game. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you learned something. And I hope you have a good one. Best of luck to you and your Pokemon fan game endeavors. Bye now!